Oh, hello there. I'm Judge Ekron, and I normally sit in the courtroom, but today I'm in the classroom. During one of my last court cases, somebody asked me, how do you do judging? And I thought this is a very good question, mainly because in courtroom as it stands, there are very few set rules or regulations that people follow. And a good set of rules and regulations can really help lead a courtroom to success. Therefore today, I thought I would write a load of information down over there, and we could talk about the procedure of court that I follow. Perhaps in the hopes that maybe you start following it too. Up to you in time, but let's not waste any more time. Let's head on over and have a look. Ooh, yes, this is meant to be one shot. So as you can see, I've written down the entire procedure of court and everything that I go through more or less, with a start, a middle, and an end. You, of course, are not obliged to go through this in exactly the same way, and of course you may make any modifications that you need to do, that's just the way things go, but this is how I do it. So we'll begin at the beginning. The start is very simple. It's please. Obviously, you're bringing out a crime, and they're going to make a plea. For example, you, person 04, accused of murdering your mother as she slept in her bed. How do you plead? Is a good sort of opening statement for that, because it is very simple. It gets your authority as a loud and obnoxious judge out there. It directly puts the charge in front of them, and it gives them the chance to return. They will plead innocent or guilty. You want them for the duration of court to plead innocent. Otherwise, you know, guilty, they just go straight to jail. That's no fun. So then you go, right, we move on to evidence gathering. So it's like, we have heard the crimes against Mr. Person 01 and his plea of not guilty. Therefore, we shall be moving to a criminal trial. I will be giving the lawyers the possibility now of five minutes, standard time I give them, to collect their evidence. Now, in a courtroom, if you've been in there before, you know that there's nine evidence podiums in the back room labeled one to nine. I like to give the prosecution podium number one to four and the defense podium number five to eight. This means that you know where the defense and the prosecution's evidence is going to be, you know that they're going to have equal amount of evidence, which is four, and you know you can use evidence podium number nine for a piece of critical evidence you can use in your case. For example, perhaps person 01 used a sword to murder them, and that would be the critical evidence is the alleged murder weapon, and then you make them refer back to that. So that's evidence gathering. During this time as well, there are things that you should be doing as a judge if you're uh, adding particular things in, but we'll cover those as we cover the rest of everything here. You may also wish to give your defense attorney the time to speak to their clients so they can get their story straight, and that is important for the witnesses section, which we'll go into when we get there. We then move on to explanations, and explanations is very simple. It's roughly what I'm doing here, where you explain the entire procedure of court and what is expected of them, along with any rules that you have imposed on the courtroom. For example, I use an objection rule. Now, I don't use an official objection rule like, say, a law-abiding court judge might actually do. Remember, I'm an idiot. But my objection rules are very simple. Push the button, I either say, go ahead, abstained, which means they have to wait until I tell them, or overruled. And if they don't follow the rules, their objections are overruled as a punishment. This just stops people randomly smacking the button and screaming whilst the other lawyer is going, because we know how bad somebody interrupting your train of thought and communication can screw up your entire story. And a lot of what you do in courtroom and VR chat is storytelling. It's so easy to throw them off, and good lawyers know this and will use it to their advantage. Yes, they may say objection, but if they have to wait and abstain, it means the other lawyer can carry on and not have their train of thought broken, and that is very important. But uh, I got completely distracted there. Wipe the rules. But that's explanation, so we move on. So we now move on to the middle section of the case. This is the case that your lawyers specifically will be taking part in fully. Once we reach past this point, the lawyers are literally no longer required. So if you can, if your lawyers need to leave in a certain amount of time, try and strive to get this bit done, because even if they've gone from that point, it doesn't matter. Opening statements. Normally, I allow the prosecution and the defense in that order to make their opening statements. Opening statements are very small, simple explanations of what's going on. For example, the prosecution may go, Your Honor, I believe that person ever one murdered his mum in a blind rage using a broadsword from his LARPing experience because she wouldn't let him keep his internet hentai love doll. I believe that I will be able to prove the murder using the evidence that I have acquired and send this gentleman who I deem to be a criminal down to jail. 
would be an example of an opening statement. It's, uh, it's short, it's concise, it gives away a tiny bit of the case in relation to a hentai pillow, which we don't know anything about, although you all know that's the love pillow at this point. And it also mentions the broadsword, which is the critical evidence, which would be on podium number nine. So that's uh, a good example of an opening statement. Uh, a bad example of an opening statement would be, uh, Your Honor, my, my client is um, innocent of the, c the crime and the, the, the prosecution, he, he's, he's lying. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Now, that's not a bad opening statement because of all the stuttering and the uncertainty. It's because it doesn't really lay anything out. It says, yes, you're innocent, but you're also accusing the prosecution of lying. It's like, don't do that. Just opening statement, nice and simple. To the point, snarpy, catchy. Because you'll never, never forget that uh, first impressions are incredibly important, especially to a judge. And as a judge, of course, you have to be remembering everything they say. That's one of the most difficult things of judging. The next part that we move on to are the full and frank cases of the prosecution and the defense. Now, I normally let the more experienced lawyer go first if the other lawyers are new. For example, if you've got, say, Optimus Winner of Knighted Man, that lovely channel, who has had many court cases with me, both victories and losses, and you are facing off against Billy Booface, who has never done a court case before, then you want to let Winner go first so he can do his case and the new guy can watch and see what is expected of him in a court case. However, if both lawyers are equally experienced, for example, if I'm a lawyer, which does happen from time to time, and if Winner is a lawyer, then you really want to let the defense go first, because the defense are the ones that are defending the case, so they need to get their story out first, because the prosecution then has to challenge the defense's story and basically try to persuade the judge, or the jury if you're doing a jury trial, I'm not bringing that up here, but you know, need to try and... Ex uh, uh, there you go, there's a train of thought thing I was talking about. It's so easy to lose it. They need to try and persuade the judge that their story is the correct one. And the defense needs to be given a slight initiative and bonus on that one, if you will. But full and frank case is using all the evidence on podiums 1 to 9, with objections allowed following the objection rules. We then move on to witnesses, which is one of the last parts that the lawyers openly take part in. Sort of. Middle ground. I find that witness questioning can be the longest part of any court case, depending on how things go. And I've slightly started changing this around a little bit. Now, the way I used to do it is you'd swear them in with a pledge of honesty, which is, uh, you know, I, person of one, promise to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And then some kind of inane thing, lest my hentai body pillow is confiscated by the police and burnt, so help me God. That's the way I do it. It's a bit of comedy that just alleviates the mood of the room to remind everybody that we're having a laugh at the end of the day and it's just a joke. And then I just go straight into witness questioning, which is where we would allow the prosecution to ask the defendant any questions in relation to the case. And then the defense will be allowed to cross-examine them. However, I have recently had the idea of actually doing witness testimony, which we've done on one case. I don't know if that one's going on YouTube because it was a bit weak. I, was, I didn't do a very good job myself. The lawyers were fine. I was very bad. Um where we ask the witness to tell us exactly what happened in their own words. And then the prosecution can ask questions relating to that, and so can the defense, to try and poke holes in the story or confirm the story. Now, as I said, we did this in a case last night where the defending lawyers were very new, and the prosecuting lawyer wasn't new. He'd done one case with me, but he was still fairly inexperienced, which is fine. Inexperience is absolutely fine. Never look down on somebody while you're doing court as a judge because they're not as confident in the way they speak or what they do because that, that's just shit, man. Don't be. Don't be like that. Be like Judge Ekron. He's a robot. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yes. So we had the case presented by the defense and then the witness testimony of the accused counted a huge amount of the defense's story, which really put it in a difficult situation. Now, neither the prosecution or the defense opted to ask any questions in that particular case, which I found a bit weird because at this point the defense really needed to be trying to save the case by perhaps trying to prove that their client was a drunkard. Yes, sometimes uh, admitting your client is an idiot or to a lesser charge is better than a worse charge. For example, if your client is accused of murdering a grandma, but you can get him off if he accepts to jaywalking, which isn't a crime in the UK, you're going to get him off for jaywalking because he's not going to be executed painfully, much like the way I like to execute people. Mmm. Executions. But yeah, so witnesses are sort of like that. I tend to try and get two witnesses per case. Always the accused, the one on the stand, is always a witness and may be the only witness to question. However, you may want to acquire another character witness, and I don't normally tell the defense or the prosecution of this witness until the case is already in process. 
This is where you as a judge were doing explanations, or evidence gathering rather, evidence gathering, my mistake, not explanations, need to be talking to the members of the bench. If you have, especially in the public room, this is difficult, but you have a good group of people who are willing to sit there and listen to a court case and get involved, you can say, hey, you over there, would you like to be a witness in this case? And if they say yes, what I tend to do is then say, okay, so you are person 001's internet girlfriend he's met you once and it's like i give them a role that they are that wasn't a very good example but i give them a role they are and say listen to the case the prosecution and the defense roughly puts out and come up with a story in your mind he's accused of murdering his mom with a broadsword used for larping come up with a story see how things go now especially in regards to witnesses with um actually giving their testimony this can go either of two ways because if you're they want you want them to give a testimony you might have to give them a few more specific details like you know he brought the broadsword because he showed you a picture of it a picture of him holding it all hardcore so you know he owns it but you don't know what he's done with it you don't know if it's real but you know he brought it off this website so it's extra little details they may ask questions they may not but that's witness questioning the way i do it and witness questioning can drag out the court case i've had court cases where 40%, 50% of it has just been witness case questioning. Court cases for me last anywhere from half an hour to 180 minutes, depending on the severity of the case. About an hour is standard for me. Anyway, amendments. Moving on to the next point, because I've talked about witnesses for far too long. Amendments are something I've added in. As far as I'm aware, these aren't actually a legal term, but then a lot of this isn't legal anyway. Woo! Legalities! Amendments are an opportunity you give to lawyers to change something in their case. Now, the example I give in the courtroom, for example, is Bob the Skeleton has a habit of putting a dildo in his left eyeball. However, and this is what the defense has told us, however, during witness questioning, Bob the Skeleton actually admitted he likes to put it in his right eyeball, not his left eyeball. During amendments, you will go along the lines of, uh, Your Honor, I made a case point in relation to my client liking to put dildos in his left eyeball. Uh, I'd like to correct that and say he actually put them in his right eyeball. And especially if you're doing witness testimonies themselves, that causes the defense's lawyer to line up with the witness as well. So the story becomes more coherent and believable. Now, amendments, I allow them to be objected to. If a prosecuting lawyer thinks an amendment is too serious, for example, Your Honor, my client is a zombie from outer space, is what you said on the stand when you were defending. But then you go, actually, Your Honor, my client is a nun and was nowhere near the place that that car was stolen. The prosecuting lawyer could object and say, Your Honor, this is far too much of a story change. It's completely changing the case right at the end. I don't think it should be included. As a judge, you have to make those judgment calls. You let them or you don't let them. I don't let them know if amendments have been accepted until judge's summary because I'm a bastard. But amendments, yes. Most people should have no amendments to make. Uh, I had more amendments in one court case last night, the first one we used witness testimony with, than I have in every other court case I've done. And I'm a good 30 to 40 court cases with this set up in now probably closer to 25 but i'm a good 20 to 30 court cases using this setup in now so i'm fairly experienced with it that's why i'm teaching you if you're listening maybe you're not but don't forget to like comment subscribe i'm a robot and the last part that we move on to now with the lawyers are our closing statements closing statements are much like opening statements they are short concise statements about your case however now you can reference evidence for example a prosecution might go your honor i believe that i have successfully proven the guilt of person 001 for killing his mother by showing that he was at the location at the time using the calendar the weapon itself used and the fact that the body pillow had blood on it because he carried it with him during the murder i do believe that he shall be found guilty this fine day would be a perfect example of a closing statement for a prosecution because it lays out his case why he thinks he's guilty and leaves it in the judge's or the jury's hand the defense of course can do the same a bad closing statement would be as was exampled i'd like to remind you that i am a kung fu master and if the jury does not find this man guilty i will find you and i will kick the out of you which was pretty much a closing statement we had i don't actually remember if he won that case it was a very weird case i think he might have it was a jury case i think he did yeah, yeah, that was, he won that case. He, he was one of the worst lawyers I've seen. Hilarious lawyer. Absolutely off the wall. Funny, but uh, lawyering skills, whoo boy. But he won. Anyway, there are all the parts of this. Once this is done, the lawyers are done. They don't necessarily need to be here anymore. So if they have to go, that's cool. 
So we'll move on now to the explanation of the end. Ending is everything to do with the judge at this point, or the jury. So, judge's summary. This is always my favourite part of the court case, but it's a real test of your memory as a judge. Because in a judge's summary, you open the panel and go through every piece of evidence that has been presented to you by the prosecution and then the defence. Now, I normally take the case that was presented first, so if I let the defence go first, the defence's case is reviewed first. You talk about every piece of evidence and every amendment made, as well as the critical evidence, and your own personal thoughts. Because at the end of the day, if you're judging, you're the one that's interpreting this. You allow no objections and no amendments here. This is what you've been told, unless you are catastrophically wrong and you request information, which I had to do the other night. You then do the same with the prosecution covering the case. Have a good think about it. Hmm. At this point during judge's summary, and this is far more important than I'm making it out to be, if you've done any, say, the numbers game, or you've done a coin toss, or you've done anything along those lines to determine something that cannot be determined, and we'll go into that in a minute, then you would reveal that here for them to know. The next thing you move on to is judgment. Let's say person 001 has been found guilty of murdering his mother. That's the judgment. You found him guilty, or you found him innocent. You could find a mistrial if you really wanted. I'd never done that before. You could find something else, but uh, normally it's innocent or guilty. Because you've got to bear in mind as well that uh, we're all in courtroom. We haven't got a clue what we're doing. We're all having a laugh at the end of the day. Plus, reasonable doubt. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. And then we move on to sentencing. Sentencing is the fun bit, because this is the, uh, if they've been found guilty, what's going to happen to them. Now, in most cases, I do tend to execute people, because why not? And I like to do the weirdest executions, for example, uh, one case, the gentleman had a pair of elephant testicles shoved down his throat with a hole drilled in them, so he would slowly choke to death whilst he was being teabagged. In another one, which is on YouTube now, I think it is, uh, she was sentenced to death by being given to her only fans with no kind of security. Uh, somebody else was sentenced to death by uh, being the personal shopper of a Karen. You know, it's things like this. Silly, silly things that give a bit of a laugh and are very, very harsh. They get the best reaction out of the audience that's watching. Because one thing you have to do as a judge is make the case interesting enough that your audience isn't going to either leave or be a bunch of annoying brushes. So that's the rough procedure of court that I choose to follow when I'm doing a court case. Pretty simple. Once you've done it a couple of times, it'll be a lot easier and you'll start to figure out how it goes. And the more people you get doing this, the more likely that decent courtrooms with a structure are going to go on. And people are going to be like, courtroom's worth coming in now. That no-no spot video is gone. This is good. Yes. Now, let's talk about some other stuff. Which I hadn't planned. But, so I haven't got anything written, but I'll talk about it quickly. So... I'm going to uh, walk back to the podium, I think. Yes, we're going to walk back over here to do this bit now, because I hadn't planned this bit, but I'm going to talk about it. During a court case in real life, especially with something like a murder, you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the person is guilty before they can be found guilty. And some people will bring up beyond reasonable doubt. I find that proving something beyond reasonable doubt in VR chat is very, very difficult because the evidence we have is very, very specific. For example, there is a block of Minecraft granite. How's that relevant to anything? They, there's no way to prove where that's come from, what it is exactly, etc. So the, they may say this is a part of the stonework from the house that was destroyed in the gas explosion, for example. The defense will say, could say, prove it. How do you prove it? It's a difficult question because they'll be like, well, it came from there. Prove it. Well, it came from there. Prove it. Well, it came from there. Prove it. And it's just this repeating circle that's no fun. So I, as a judge, hop in with various options. We do the numbers game. I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 10. Mr. Defense, as you made the original claim, what number am I thinking of? Mr. Prosecution, what number am I thinking of? Okay, carry on. I never tell them, unless it's incredibly important to the entire case. Uh, this is very, very your choice. Or you can toss a coin. I have a 1995, I think it is, pound coin down there. That is the coin. And whenever it comes to it, it's a coin cost. So say the defense is making a claim, Mrs. Defense, heads or tails? Uh, tails. Okay, carry on. Once again, never explaining. So that covers that. Sometimes this is the fairest way to do it, and there has to be some suspension of disbelief as well. For example, we had a case where um, the defense claimed that the knife that had been used in the murder couldn't be the knife because it wasn't bloody. It, it just wasn't bloody. Now, we all know the knife that's in courtroom is clean. 
The, defense, uh, the prosecution said that it was a replica sent by the police as the original was in custody, and the defense said, well, that's not the knife, so that evidence is completely irrelevant. They have a point that the evidence is irrelevant, but at the same time, completely dismissing a piece of evidence because you can't prove exactly is kind of a terrible thing to do. So I tend to say we're running with suspension of disbelief. I'm going to allow this evidence as it is, as the prosecution has claimed it to be. This is the knife allegedly used in the murder. Please carry on. Because otherwise it just turns into a case of trying to disprove everybody's evidence with stupid technicalities. And that's no fun. You want to kind of disprove each other through words, actions and providing a comprehensive and entertaining story. What's the last thing I was going to talk about? If I can't remember it, we'll just have to end the video there. That would be sad. That's not sad, that's angry. There we go, that's sad. That would be sad. And I think I have forgotten it. Right. Well then, I do believe that covers everything except for what I've forgotten. Thank you for watching. I do hope this video has been somewhat useful to trying to figure out how to do judging related stuff. Uh, I've actually enjoyed talking about this because I've had a couple of people ask me uh, about the way you do procedural court and so forth. And once again, just to reiterate, I'm not a legal person. I'm a bus driver. I'm thick as two planks. But even I can come up with this stuff. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you'd like to see some more court cases and the other things on VR Chat I'm putting out, as well as, of course, my regular content, which is toy reviews and all that lot. So, yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you around. Join me in court sometime. I'll find you guilty.